Retraining of Racehorses is British Horse Racing's official charity for the welfare of racehorses who have retired from racing. These wonderful animals can put their intelligent minds to so many different pursuits. These are just some of them. Well, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the first of four sessions over the next three weeks, encompassing the best in the industry to tell you a little bit about the work of uh, retraining of racehorses. This is an online educational event, as I said, four sessions over the next three weeks, and we've got a wonderful panel for you tonight as well, plus the opportunity for you to ask any questions at the end as well. Uh, this is about showcasing the beauty, the brilliance and the versatility of the thoroughbred racehorse and what it can do not only during its racing career, but after his or her racing career as well. As I said, we've got a wonderful panel for you. Um, I can introduce you top left if you can see her top left. I can anyway. Uh, it is um, Annalisa Balding, who is an integral part of the huge training setup that is now and, and has been Kings Clear for so many decades, one of the country's leading training establishments. Uh, Annalisa's husband, Andrew, now has his name on the license for Annalisa. Some, I certainly would argue, jump jockey uh, before carving out a new career and certainly new heights as a racing broadcaster. Two years ago, voted uh, racing broadcaster of the year and has also worked in addition to his uh, work on ITV for BBC Five Live Sky Sports Racing uh, and still now uh, rides out and trains point to pointers with um, considerable success. He'll start shaking his head in a minute, but he's actually quite modest about his excellent strike rate with, uh, with point to pointers. Um, <laughs> Diana Cooper is with us, I'm really pleased to say this evening in, on the top right there. Diana, give us a wave. Um, Diana's been a, a massive part of Sheikh Mohammed's uh, racing and breeding operation now for, for over 20 years, working in the UK and Europe and the USA and Japan, Australia and Dubai. And as the strategic advisor now, She's heading up uh, Godolphin's global charitable programs, which include the Flying Start, the Dali Now Godolphin Flying Start, plus the Godolphin Stud and Stable Staff Awards, uh, IFAR, the International Forum for the Aftercare of Racehorses. So um, taking, uh, taking stock of all uh, parts of the, of the racing and bloodstock industry. Yogi Breisner, who is to my bottom left, um, it looks as though Yogi's in the sauna, but I, I'm, I don't <laughs> think he is. Um, one of the, the world's best known coaches uh, and instructors in equestrian sport, a part of the Swedish eventing team in the 1970s and the 1980s, competed at the Olympics, but has almost become better known uh, as the chef to keeping performance manager for British eventing, uh, for which he earned an MBE, as well as countless Olympic and European titles. And I'm really pleased to say Yogi is still in Britain working with the Swedish Equestrian Federation, as well as his UK clients. So you have got some of the biggest and best uh, in the sport of horse racing and in equestrian sport as well. And uh, we're going to start before we come to your questions, I, I think with Annalisa. Annalisa, first of all, congratulations that the stables had a winner this evening with a, uh, probably an example of a horse who would be a challenge to retrain. Absolutely. We were just start, um, talk, chatting before the start of the webinar. Retraining of racehorses is so important, but I think one of the most important thing is that we're retraining racehorses who should be retrained. And Johnny Drama, I'm not sure, is the ultimate retraining of racehorse example. He's a fabulous looking horse. He's beautiful on the gallops. He's a total savage in his, in his, um, in his stable. And this year we've had various trips to accident and emergency with their uh, ears coming off and, and all sorts. But um, luckily he's, he's won four on the bounce now. So uh, he's earning his keep and getting a little bit more love. And so how, just for, for people who don't know, how many horses would you have in uh, Kingsclear at any one time? So we've got 210 boxes, um, pretty much all flat, 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 flat for, oh, to race on flat. Um, this time of year, we're actually sort of, sort of a few down just because we're, we've sort of done what happens in a school at the end of July before the September new term. We've sort of got sold a lot of them, moved a lot on, and we're just, just about to get all the babies in soon to be turning two-year-olds. And so how many horses would you need to rehome on a, on a sort of annual basis? Well, we're very lucky as a flat trainer because we actually have got huge access to the sales. And we, we pass on a lot of our horses through the Tattersall, you know, all the big sales companies, 
either at the horses in training sale or at the mayor's sales or also the international market between sales is so key to us the hong kong market the american market the australian market as we all know you know desperately trying the australians desperately trying to get a melbourne cup cup horse in particular so we actually have got lots of outs I reckon, I mean, at the moment we have four horses on the place that are currently, we, we are actually trying to retrain. Mm -hmm. um, and realistically, I don't think more than 2% of the horses that we train, we are responsible for retraining. And just to, just to give a bit of context, in terms of the work regime for your horses, for a typical horse in training at Kingsclear, what would their, what would their average day look like? Well, so, so they're exercised six days a week. They're actually out of their stable for about an hour and a half. That includes, you know, a good wash down and a pick of grass after exercise. I think as everyone sort of on this panel certainly knows, the racehorse, they love the routine. And the routine is so key. And I think Andrews and his team, the team here at Kingsclear, we try and stick to that. And the horses tend to be exercised the same time of day. They tend to go out the same lot every day. They get fed three times a day at the same time. So generally they're looked, they're, they're fed actually at sort of five o'clock in the morning. They tend to go out at exercise between seven and nine. They, so seven and 11, I suppose, and fed again at 12.30 and then they're mucked out and groomed in the evening and fed at six. Luke, how does that differ for you? As you're training, what, one or two point to pointers at any one time? And I, I know you, you do it as a hobby, but you have to take it just as seriously because you're responsible for the care of these horses. Would you be able to put more exercise into them or, or about the same? I, uh, you know, I, I had the clue about sort of feeding or anything else. So, so I ride, I'm lucky I'd live just down the road from Nicky Henson. I was thinking, well, if it's good enough for him, I feed exactly and do exactly the same routine as he does. It seems to work quite well for him. Um, but no, as you say, I only, I only have ever have one horse. Um, and because I work with horses, and it's, it's, it's my, my job. Um, and when you're sort of, when you're involved with horses, you, you try not to get too involved emotionally with them. But of course I'm, I'm just doing one, one horse and very, you know, quite often riding them out in the dark before I go off to the races or what have you. Um, so I end up getting very emotionally attached to horses. Um, and so when their racing days are over, um, I've normally got them at the end of their career anyway, but when, when, when their days are finally over, um, I, I, it's, I, 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 it's, it's the, my highest priority. I think one of the greatest achievements I've ever had in horse racing, I had a horse called Paul Bay, who was, who was tremendously good to me. He, he won me loads of races and I managed to find um, him a home with a, a girl called Emma Bracewaite, who used to work for Jenny Pittman. And he now leads the, her children around and he, he doesn't do anything grand. He, he, he wouldn't be very good at anything, you know, in particular jumping or, or mm. anything. But to, to the satisfaction it gave me to find that horse who I genuinely loved more than any human being I've ever loved. Uh, it was, was, was absolutely immense. And it is, it's genuinely one of the proudest moments I've had in horse racing. Um, and we all have such a, a collective responsibility to these these beautiful animals. Um, Yogi, in, in your experience, does the does the routine that a racehorse has, and it is a more a, a more routine environment, does that make them more suitable for for translating to to other disciplines? I think that the uh, quality and the intelligence of a thoroughbred horse uh, makes him so versatile, and we see him in all sorts of disciplines, right from the racing which he was bred to do right through to polo, show jumping, dressage, eventing, and just as generally fun horses for people to hack around on or go hunting with. And I think it is a real credit to the breed that he is so versatile. I think also the thoroughbred has a real advantage in that particularly the flat horses, they are handled from a very early age and they are handled by professional people they get prepared for the sales ring as yearlings. They are professionally broken in as yearlings stroke two-year-olds. They then go through their racing career where they get used to a lot of different things. They get used to the environment of the race course, the routine of a training environment, the uh, starting stalls. They get jumping if they go international hand racing. And they get an all-round education that stands them in very, very good stead for later on in life. Of course, you're going to get exceptions to the rule that Horses are not suitable to certain things. And the same as the sports horse breed, uh, they are going to be good 
natured horses and there are going to be some horses that are more difficult to, to handle. But generally, the sport horses don't really start their education until they are three, four years of age. So they have a two couple of years to catch up on the thoroughbred horse who has had that all round education. And I think it's a real credit, not just to the breed, as I said, but also to the trainers all over the world, but particularly here in England and Ireland, who uh, the way they deal with the horses, the way they produce the horses, makes them very useful for life afterwards. And the routine that they have got into makes it easier for the transition because you can just replicate that routine. And that means that the horses very quickly would change from being racing machines to being normal riding horses. I'm, I'm interested to know, we often try and ascribe human characteristics to horses and I don't really know, you would have a much better idea. Uh, is a thoroughbred innately more intelligent? I think the thoroughbred is bred to be quick in its reactions. It's bred to to race and be alert and to uh, 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 run like you know they are doing on the racetrack. And I think over the generations that has bred a horse that is quick and smart in its reactions. And you can see now in the sport horse breeding, the thoroughbred bloodlines has been very very important to come out with what we used to call three quarter bred, seven eighths bred horses. But even in the warm blood horses from the continent, there is quite a predominant thoroughbred influence now. And I think that breeders all over the world have seen the benefit of having thoroughbred in their bloodlines. Wait, Diana, you come into contact with so many thoroughbreds. I mean, the, the sheer scale of the Godolphin operation, just give us some indication of how, of how big it is now across the world. Well, as, as you said, thank you for that introduction. Sorry about the kerfuffle earlier on. Um, <laughs> the, we operate yeah, in seven countries, obviously Dubai, Japan, Australia, America, Ireland, France, and here. And we'd have about a thousand horses in training at any one time at the moment. Wow. Six, 62 horses, 62 stallions that start between the Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. So from the stallions alone, um, obviously we aren't responsible for the, for the mares that they breed, but, but that produces a lot of horses. And it's been something in the... DNA of Godolphin since I know over the over the years that we understand there's an intrinsic you know, responsibility for them after they've left our care and onwards. Uh, and there have been some wonderful examples of some really big name, high profile Godolphin horses who've gone on and excelled in other disciplines. And I know you would say quite rightly, it's not just about the horses who've won classics or won group one races, it's about every horse, however limited they might be. But how important are the high profile ones in bringing people's attention to what you're trying to do? Well, they're, well, A, they're incredibly close to our heart. You know, the horses that, that have given us such highs of emotion and all through, you know, from our principal to the trainers, to all the people in the yard, to all the people in the offices and on the stud farms. Um, and we, across, across that global outreach that we've got. So for example, we've got a wonderful horse at the moment that's, in Dartmoor right now, but he started life on a woodland stud in, in Australia, which um, which Godolphin now owns. Um, he has the Woodlands brand on his shoulder. He was a Group Two winner there. He was a Group Two winner in Dubai for Saeed bin Saroor. Came to Newmarket, raced for us here, and um, is now retired to Dartmoor hike to D Dartmoor hawking. Um, has a lovely life. He actually lost an eye, poor fellow, as a, with an abscess at one stage. So he is a one-eyed a thoroughbred who's galloping across Dartmoor um, with, with Martin uh, Whiteley on his back with a, and, a, and a falcon, and he couldn't be happier. Uh, Papineau is, won the, Dubai, won the um, Aski Gold Cup for us back in 2004. Enormous great big horse. He was in training with Andre Fab for us as a two-year-old. I remember getting around even stables with Andre, and this enormous great big chestnut um, was in the box, and Andre said, listen, we're going to have to leave him. This is the month of February. We have to leave him for the next month or so. Three years later, he wins the Athlete Gold Cup, and he's been a real ambassador. And I think that's, in answer to your question, the most important thing about these high-profile horses. Um, Fapino taught children at the Newmarket Academy how to feed him polar mints. He's got a wonderful overbite, and he's just going to suck, suck them off the children's palm, palms of their hands. And it's the first time some of those children have ever been around any kind of a horse, let alone a thoroughbred. And the look of pure joy on their face to see, to touch, to smell, you know, a horse that close, let alone have a kind of, you know, pulling it sucked off, 
We've got, um, on a more serious note, Judy Frizzell has done a fantastic job in Namibian, but Mark Johnson trained to win the Queen's Vars and Gordon Stakes, he's, um, he's, he's excelled at para dressage. So there's all, so that's already three different disciplines that these horses um, can excel at. And it's just, if they're happy, if, they're, if they've got an occupation, I think it helps so much in their second careers. And the nice thing, Annalisa, is that their second career can be a very, very long one. Necessarily, often for flat horses, their racing career is, is quite a short one, but they've also got to be extremely fast learners. Just give us an indication as to that period between actually the time they're broken in and the time they're being asked to do something. Well, this time of year, is it, we are in that transition. So most of the yearlings were bought October, first two weeks of October, let's say, They've, they've gone to be broken in in various different places and they will all pretty much be here by the beginning of January with a view to possibly making the racetrack by May. So within six months, they've gone from zero to hopefully hero. Yogi, when you, when you hear that and appreciate that, and you know that, of course, already, um, does it make you think a little bit as somebody who's, who's got so much experience of all equestrian disciplines? Does it ever really strike you what we ask a thoroughbred to do and, and in such a short space of time? Well, I think it's um, a credit to the horse uh, in general and to the thoroughbred horse in particular that they can uh, achieve these things. And when you think, yes, getting onto the racetrack, in that period that Annalisa has described, they have gone from never having had a rider on their back to having a rider on their back to learn what the uh, bit is doing in their mouth, when, when to stop, when to steer left, when to steer right, when to go forward. They have learned how to go in a, out in a stream with maybe 30, 40 other horses. They have learned how to counter upsides. They have learned how to mm -hmm. go through a starting stall, how to jump out of a starting stall. And all of that thing they have learned. And then they come onto the racetrack with the loudspeakers and the music going on and crowds being there. And they canter down to the start. And if you look at the early two-year-old race, you might have 12 runners in it and you, they walk down at the start. And yes, you might see one or two horses fidget a little bit, but the majority of horses already that early on, they settle down by the start, they go into the starting gate and then uh, they race. And again, I think it's credit to the horse, but it's also credit to the, all the people that has been handling them. And of course that transfers when you then want to give them a second career because they are fast learners and they are uh, uh, ready to take on new things and new challenges, even later on in life. And, Let's face it, a lot of horses will come out of racing as maybe even four, five, six-year-olds, which is very young for a riding horse. A normal sport horses is only in the beginning of their career then. But this ability to learn fast stands you in good stead. It actually, the majority of horses will re-school into a half-decent riding horse within, I would say, week to month rather than years. Diana, the one the one thing a horse has to have if if that if he or she is going to be registered in the stud book is is eight generations of recognizable pedigree and um with that in mind you, you're, you're familiar with pretty much all of these pedigrees does it does it inform how they are trained or do they all simply have to conform <clears throat> um when they come into us as yearlings there's no doubt that they are they're assessed and very quickly is seeing which ones might be, as Annalisa says, um, performing hopefully a top draw from May, June time, but May, June time. But the pedigree is a wonderful guide. Um, as with horses down through the, down over the years and they when they when they um, start the second career as well, you it's really the for me it's their makeup, it's their physical makeup and their mental ability to cope with with like any children when they come into school. Some of them will go forward more quickly than others some of the physical and mental attributes that will label it. And the pedigree, yes, of course, you know, if you're a Usain Bolt or a Mo Farah, you're going to have different, um, but diff different ranges of possibilities. And are there, are there characteristics and traits that you notice in the, in the female size of the pedigree? Does it, does it keep coming out over and over again? Horses who are maybe a little quirky or horses who are very generous, horses who've got great temperaments? You certainly like to think that what would be wonderful is, is if their, their ability and the race force for those absolutely top class um, um, mares, if they could produce that every year, then none of us would we'd all be probably lying in a, in a Caribbean island right now um, because it would be mm. such a success. 
but sadly it doesn't work like that yes there are definitely traits <laughs> i would say you know both physical and um mental but um um uh, but uh, again like all children each one um isn't isn't necessarily guided by that when it comes to their, their prowess and race course i want to talk a little bit about sort of the the physique of a of a thoroughbred yogi because horses off the track can come in all different shapes and sizes the more sprinter model would be a closer couple more compact big back end wouldn't wouldn't necessarily walk quite so well and then you've got the sort of rangy um middle distance types and the, the big hefty steeple chasers you know, which horses do you think are best suited to to other careers or can they all be equally well suited to something else I mean, they, they obviously need to have certain contributions. If you're looking at a horse that is going to be competitive in dressage, they need to have a temperament that means that they can concentrate whilst they do the test, and they need to have three basically good paces and paces that you can develop. If you get uh, uh, race horses are bred basically to gallop, so therefore they, the majority of them have a very good canter and they have a, a good gallop, but they don't always have a good trot because they don't need to use the trot. Often trainers would say that, you know, a horse with a good walk has a good gallop and good canter and walk often at the sales ring, a trainer would look at how a horse is walking because I think that indicates how athletic they are and so on and so forth. So those two very often goes hand in hand, but the movement is important. Naturally, if they're going into the show jumping sphere, they need to be naturally careful so they don't knock the poles over. And in the eventing, they need to have a combination of those two at the same time as they need to be brave to jump ditches and go up and down the banks. And whilst the polar pony need to be very handy and quick in its turning, etc. So I don't think that there is a particular stand that we come out of the uh, racing world that would suit specific disciplines. Naturally, if a horse has gone jumping, then we know that they can jump. But likewise, there might be that that they have learned how to brush through a fence, so they might not be that careful in how they are approaching the jump. So um, I think the temperament is naturally important. Don't forget the thoroughbred horse is bred on performance and therefore that sorts itself out. And so the majority of horses that come out of training are bred to perform and therefore they will have certain criteria when it comes to that temperament. And as I said before, there are always exceptions, but my experience is that the majority of them have a very good temperament to reschool, and they have had this varied and very rounded education in that they've got to use to a lot of things. So I think there is no specific type. And it's amazing that I, I couldn't believe it last year when I was working at, at Burley Horse Trials that there was a, a horse who'd been competing at the top level. Yogi, you'll remember his name, and I, I can't. Um, but I think had run something like 78 times on the dirt in Philadelphia Park before before becoming a five-star eventer it's yes. quite remarkable absolutely and you know it, it, these are horses that some of them have been running when they were two years of age and three years of age and they are still active when they are 14 15 16 17 years of age luke are you are you constantly surprised by the horses that you that you deal with and you train no, I, I think we were just talking about, you know, horses that, that seem to be able to, you know, they're broken in as yearlings and then they carry on all the way through and they end up jumping hurdles and they're jumping fences. I think it's, it's the mindset of these horses. There's, there's no sort of blueprint about what is good and what is bad. There's no two ways about it that, that the breeding of the horse sort of underpins the whole industry. But it's a, it's a, it's a guide more than anything else. You know, if your horse is well bred, obviously it's, it's worth more money if it, if it can then perhaps achieve something on the course, but it's by no way, no means a, a guarantee. And most of the horses, look, I'm working on a, on a very limited budget. Most of the horses that I've bought and had success with have been purely and utterly that I've, I've just watched them at the sales. You know, they've been trotted up all afternoon and then I just watched them the last, give them one last trot up before they go into the, into the ring perhaps. And they're still sweet as a nut and willing to do it. Some horses just get browned off it and don't want to. And so for me, the mental strength of any horse, whatever discipline he's in, um, is key and, and 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 that's how I've managed to have a bit of luck with horses but the, the, the great thing for anyone that's getting involved is 
there is no stereotype. There is there are there are you know if you lined every one of the Cheltenham Festival or, or Royal Ascot up, they're all different. They're all different shapes. They're all different characters, and so it gives it does give obviously the, the you know the, the big guys have have a better chance, but it does give everyone a chance of having that winner. Well, Luke, I was I was watching Ted Walsh the other day, and somebody said to him that his nice big horse that had just won a hurdle race was bound to make a better chaser. The great cliche. And Ted turned around. <laughs> How do you know that he hasn't jumped a chase fence yet? Just because he's big, it doesn't mean he'll be a brilliant jumper. And I suppose that's it. We shouldn't really pigeonhole these horses until we know what they can do. No, and but but that's I don't think that's the beauty of it. You know, you you just don't know. You know, you 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 get all these wonderful stories of horses that cost absolutely nothing. A, a lot, particularly, I'm talking mainly jumping. A lot of the better horses are freaks. You know, they 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 they're not they're not even bred to do what they're doing. You know, for instance, um, Altio runs in Tinker Creek. He's by High Chaparral. You know, so it, it, you know, not not a fashionable sire, not a sire particularly of jumpers, and and yet he's he's one of the best horses we've ever seen. So, you know, I, I think that's and 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 it's exactly the same when you're retraining horses. You just never know the horse that you think. Or he he was really keen when he was in training. He he used to duck out at things. You take that high protein food out of them, and you give them a, a different environment. They they change. You cannot believe how much they can change. Annalisa, are there horses that have come from your yard and and done other things that you've thought I would never have imagined them being X or Y? Well, I think Side Glance actually is is a good example. Who was Side Glance was a horse that my mother in law. Um, bred and he actually went on and won the McKinnon in Australia and Leanne one of our head girls he, she actually looks after she looked after him in training traveled him around the world and Shaper had very kindly gave side glance to to Leanne when he retired he was a very very buzzy horse he was very on his toes he was loved by everyone but the thought that as these pictures show look I mean isn't that amazing? Mm. Oh, I don't know, I'm competing. You know, he, he literally carried Leanne to her wedding. <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty remarkable. I mean, he, he looks as if he's going absolutely beautifully there as well. Yeah. And there's, and that, that's actually Bumbling Birds. Oh, who was, a, who was another Bumbling horse. But, um, no, but that, oh, was, that was another horse right. that Andrew trained. And I actually was also bred at Kingsclear as well. Um, I mean, Bumbling Bertie is great. He actually, I think he was rated 45 on the flat, which I, for those who don't know, that that's the sort of the bottom set in the academic scale. Um, and that to see him going like that is just fantastic. And, and Lucy giving him the most wonderful time and huge credit to her for what she's achieving. And we talked about pedigrees. I mean, Bertolini, Diana, was a was a sprinter that that uh, Godolphin or Dali stood for many years. So it just it just goes to show, doesn't it? One hundred percent, absolutely. Um, there's no there's as I said before, you know, if we if it was that easy to to match a stallion with a mare and produce what you hoped, then it would be a very boring industry we're in, as, as opposed to the one that's, that is as exciting in every which way. As this. But to see these horses having such a fantastic time after racing, after they've been kind of deprogrammed and, and, and learn just how to use themselves differently, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, Yogi, I wanted to ask you, when, when people come to you with x race horses and you've worked with some notable ones as well and say, right, help me out, where do I go here? What, how interventionist are you? What do you try and do? Where do you start? Well, I think the first step when a horse comes out of training is to, like Luke said, take it off the high octane feed and uh, get back to what a normal horse would get. So you lower the protein, you lower the, the energy in the feed, and also that you give them a little bit of a break when they come out of uh, uh, racing, if you can, because then you get rid of some of the fitness in the horses, so they come down on a level playing field. And even just by taking the food down, give it three, four days, and you're actually dealing with a different horse. Stick with the routine with the horses, but you don't need to go out and start galloping and doing all those sorts of things. I think it's always a good idea, and I would say this to anyone that gets a horse that they don't know, pop it on the lunge first, put saddle and bridle on it, turn it a few times around on the lunge to see what it's like. Because naturally, if a horse goes from one place to the other, once the day has been set that that horse is traveling out to the yard, the horse might not necessarily be exercised which I think is good they might just go on the walk or 
the food would be taken down already, which I think is good because then they do come out of the training yard a little bit more settled down, etc. Be aware of what the routines are in, in the racing yard. They might not have had a proper general purpose saddle or jumping saddle or dressage saddle on. So they might be unfamiliar to having a bigger saddle on their back. They might never have been mounted off the ground with a foot in the stirrup. They might have always had a leg up. So it's just small things like that, uh, where we take the routine from the racing yard and gradually work it into what we are going to do with them as, as riding horses. And then it's just the normal A, B and C. We make sure that they start learning to go forward for the leg instead of just when a jockey pushes it out. <clears throat> they are very often good in their mouth in that they will slow down and they will steer. But then comes that stage where you saw the picture of uh, the, the, the horse in the show ring with the double bridle in where they start arching their neck and they start coming on to the bit and they start working in a more collective way. Racing, it's all about generating forward propulsion and uh, that where they can go as fast as they can. And even in the jumping and jump racing, they should take off like an airplane and land like an airplane. In the normal riding, when you start jumping and doing dressage, you want more elevation. So you start bringing collection into the horses, you start teaching them to go in a slower pace on a shorter stride and just be more um, accustomed to that. And then like with any sports horse, any competition horse, you have to teach them the various bits that they have to learn. If it's a dressage horse, they learn the dressage movements. If it's a jumping horse, they learn jumping through a combination or a later distance, a dog leg. If it's an eventing horse, they have to learn to go through water and jump over ditches and so on. And a polar pony has to learn to respond to the stick and to the ball and the other horses around them. Uh, are there any no, are there any really notable racehorses that you've had particular satisfaction from working with? Was there is there a, is there a story that you uh, you were very, you were very pleased to be associated? with? I, I've been very very fortunate in that I have been lucky enough to see some, and work with some very 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 smart horses and good horses over the years uh, sometimes maybe only when they were young horses and then not needing to do anything with them afterwards or I might have worked with them halfway through their career or the back end of their uh, career and seen horses that came out of racing and in, into the eventing world as you mentioned earlier on the very very top end of the of the, of the uh, market but go back in time there was a, a particular horse that hadn't had a very good record of getting round its steeper chases I think it had fallen four times out of five runs and we did a lot of work with that horse and it came on and then eventually won both at Cheltenham and at um, Aintree in the same year and that was naturally extremely satisfactory when you saw horse coming in like that I am um, um, happened to do a little bit of work with a, a, a horse of the Queen's called Barbershop and, and then I saw him in the show ring at Burley as a retrained racehorse and he looked absolutely fabulous and really moved and so on and it would be wrong to say that hmm, yes I did a little bit of jumping with that horse maybe three, three or four times in, in my life and maybe I had about half a percent contribution to that he is enjoying going around the show ring now. Well, I, I think I honestly think Barber Shop Luke. He was a very talented racehorse, but I reckon he enjoys his showing more. <laughs> I love. Well, as I said to you, good good horses know that they're good, and they 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 love to show off. Just going back to when when you initially get a horse, the the nine times out of ten, the horses I get are second or, or third hand. I always do exactly the same thing. I always give them an MOT. You know, horses can't win races unless unless they they get you know, grade A treatment. So I'm not saying that they don't, but I always get them. I always worm them, do their teeth. I always get a physio um, to tell me where the horse has got a weakness. And I've quite often, I've changed over the years. I, I didn't believe in that sort of thing, you know, initially. But now, so I get the physio and they'll say, perhaps if you lunge him, and I've started lunging horses as now. So, so they become more supple. So they get more strength behind the saddle. And then when you're going on to do another discipline, you know, quite often horses can change their 
you know, the horse that I'm actually training at the moment, he's changed his, his shape. He, he had a year off because he, he had a tendon injury. And because of that, I was doing a bit of lunging with him and, and just helping him in the school. And he's built up. He's got a massive top line on him now. Um, hopefully it makes him run faster. I don't know, but it, it certainly makes him more supple. And if I were to do a, a, another discipline with him, it would unquestionably help him. Um, Diana, with whom do you think the responsibility ultimately lies to make sure that that racehorses find another career uh, and find the best possible way of, uh, of of getting a new a new discipline and a new life? I'm I'm in my mind I'm pretty clear that it's definitely with the owner. I think we're very lucky in the industry because in our industry because it's a it's more of a way of life full of passionate people who make a very good living or not, but we're all in it for the same reason, which is the kind of love of the horse and the joy of the, the, the sport. Um, but owners, owners, it's if you had a car, you would have a seller and a vendor. There's an awful lot of work that still needs to be done really to ensure that there's the accountability for horses after they've left the, after they've left the um, training environment um, is, Probably monitor is probably is properly monitored. Uh, trainers do a great job of advising owners how best um, they can find a better a, a, a new home for their horses if the owner can't provide that themselves. Um, it's it's difficult. I mean, personally, I've got um, you know, I've ended up with a couple of horses myself over the over the years. But thanks to knowing people around the industry, uh, there's actually I got a lovely email from one of the Godolphin Flying Start students who happens to be in Ireland at the moment at the racing academy so the, the equivalent of the british racing school and ended up <laughs> ended up learning how to how to ride a racehorse through a, a, a horse that was once trained over here and then went on to jesse harrington and is now training young students how to ride them um, but back to the godolphin again it's one of the reasons that i think godolphin feels its responsibility as i said you earlier on about the between the stallions and the racehorses we've tried to um encourage ownership responsibility through traceability in Australia, in Japan, in America. It's a different story in each area. Here in the UK, I think next year in 2021, uh, the foals that are born will have the first digital passport, which will make all these issues much more, much easier um, on all sides to, um, to work with. Uh, we've also helped to, with a, with a really strong team, including ROR, the, our chairman, Dai Abathnut Morawa, has created the International Forum for the Aftercare of Racehorses to expand the concept of ownership and, um, and looking after horses throughout their, throughout their um, lives from cradle to grave, basically. There's a toolkit on that website that explains to, in some countries where the aftercare might not be um, thought of as, and, and, and and used as much as it is in the UK. We're very lucky in the UK from, from um, the amount of horse lovers that have created the secondary careers. But the International Forum for the Aftercare Care of Racehorses does help to explain it elsewhere. I want to take your questions up until, up until eight o'clock and we're gonna have a look at something quite, quite special in a few moments time. But just before we do that, I just wanted to ask um, all of you and perhaps we'll start, start with Yogi, whether you think there's there's anything we as a, as a horse racing industry could do better to get horses prepared for a second career? Or is there any way we could communicate better? Uh, to answer the first of your question, I think that the racehorse trainers, certainly that I have been dealing with and in England and Ireland and so on, and even in France, do a fantastic job with our horses. And the material that comes out of training, in my view, is very, very good and very easy to deal with and easy to retrain always get exceptions to the route they're always going to be the odd one that it doesn't suit and that one can't uh, uh, find a, a second career for but the majority of them come out and the majority of them are pretty straightforward to go um, which is a credit to how they have been trained etc as an industry i think we can always do things better wherever one looks i think that one can do better but i think that we need to state the fact that it's very few industries that has a better care from when something enters into its industry to when it leaves, whether it is horses, the equine side, or whether it's the human side, that it's being taken care of, it's bred in a professional way, they're broken in, as I said, in a professional way. Once they're finished, we know through the RAR, there is a real system 
that is there to get up them and all the, the charities that mm. do re, uh, retraining of racehorses up and down the country and even private people who are not a charity doesn't work for the ROR but has taken in racehorses just because they love the thoroughbred horse and they love to bring it in and they do something with it and have a lot of fun with it so I think at the moment I feel very comfortable with what is going on but that doesn't mean that one can sit back and say everything is hunky-dory we can always improve. Annalisa do you have anything to add? I think what Yogi said is absolutely spot on. I think, I think the word patience is very, very important as well. Um, and I think anyone taking on a, a retired race or a racehorse to, 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 to change their careers, they've got to be able to be patient. Um, and that's not saying that, you know, I know Yogi, you referred earlier to how quickly they get broken in and how quickly, how bright they are and how quickly they set into their racing career and how quickly you can retrain them but I do think mentally sometimes it takes them a longer than what everyone thinks and you know we very often encourage people to turn the horse out for six months and then bring him back in you know and start again and I don't think as as everyone keeps saying you know there isn't a right and a wrong but I I personally and I know Andrew agrees I think patience while you're training racehorses is very important. But I also think patience when you're retraining racehorses is equally as important. Well, we've got quite a few questions to, to answer. Helen, Virginia and Sharon and others, I will be with you very shortly. But before, uh, before we get around to answering those, um, I just want to show you an example of some of the brilliant work that retraining of racehorses do with this um, short presentation put together by our friends at Equine Productions. At 620,000 older. So this is a four furlong poly track and it's a really good sort of regular routine exercise. So we do the bulk of our, the conditioning work here. We've got 210 boxes set within a sort of 200 acre plot. And then on the on Warship Down, we've got another 150 acres of, of grass gallops. With the gallops, the facilities we've got, we cater for everything. We can go right-handed, we can go left-handed, we can go uphill, we can go downhill.
I mean, I think you can see from that short, brilliantly made video by Equine Productions. And I, I know when we share these these presentations on in a format like this, and you can't really do justice to the majesty of these horses. But you could see there um, from being brought up in a place as beautiful as Kingsclear and Annalisa that that they weren't too shabby those shots, were they? I think they did justice to Kingsclear. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're a fantastic production team. But I think in that light and those clouds, you know, it was set perfectly. <laughs> I do, I could do it. <laughs> um, but I mean, like from from there, you know, you could see you could see how these horses can can excel in the show ring, eventing, show jumping, dressage. Um, Diana's given you the example of a, of a horse who's excelled in in, in para disciplines, um, pretty much anything, endurance, cutting, whatever you want. You can they can turn their hand to anything. Plenty of you've been asking us questions. Um, Ruth Keane says, uh, many horses are food orientated, and we've been talking about you know, feeding, retraining racehorses, less, less protein. My rather large ex racehorse is not bothered about a hard feed and can quite often leave a feed. Is this a typical anomaly with a racehorse, even after many years out of racing, uh, Yogi? I think the number one to answer that question is that if a horse that leaves feed, one do need to uh, look into to see, um, is it because it has uh, something wrong with its mouth, something wrong with its digestive system. Is there something that bothers it that means that it's leaving its feet? If the horse is, is a good health and is in good condition, has a good shine to its coat and is lively enough to do the job that you're asking the horse to do and is bright in its membranes, etc., then obviously it's getting enough nourishment from what it is eating and then I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, this one for, for Luke and uh Annalisa really um do horses get any downtime or is it just six days a week every week of the year continuously um Luke P people forget that that horses have to be treated they are equine athletes and so they you have to have the best of everything and uh in your in your exercise as well downtime any athlete if you're training for a marathon or if you're training for a hundred meter sprint Anyone will tell you the downtime is as un, is as important as the hard out the hard graph that goes into it. Most racehorses, just because of the way that the staff system works, would have a Sunday off, and perhaps they'd have an easy day, say on a on a on a Thursday or something. But you know they'd do have a routine day, perhaps on a on a Monday. Then they'd gallop. Then they'd have an easy day. Then they'd have another routine day. Then they'd do more, more fast work. So you're doing a lot of aerobic work. Um, and getting a core fitness into your horse. But um, it's all about getting them fit, but keeping their mind right. And that's the key thing with racehorses. Whatever discipline you do, you've got to keep that horse happy and enjoying his work. And if a horse is enjoying his work, he'll always do his best for you. With that in mind, Annalisa, a question here. Um, do the team at Kingsclear prepare horses in any way when they know their racing career is over? Do you prepare them in, in that kind of transition period for when they uh, leave? Absolutely. I think this, at this time of year, a lot of our horses have a proper holiday anyway. They have their hind shoes, you know, the geldings and the mares in particular, they have their hind shoes taken off. They're out in the field from 10 till 5 or 10 till 4 every day. They, they really have a great time. Um, so if they were... If, if we would now be looking to rehome them, again, we take the protein out of the feed. So our racehorses, they actually get a 14% feed when they're in full training. And when they're having a quiet time or they're coming back from injury, that goes down to, down to what we call a layoff cube, which is a 10% protein. That's a massive drop. And that's definitely something we would do before we were, um, we were going to, to move the horses on. I think I'm um, just going back to what Luke was saying. Luke, I agree at 100% on the holidays and the time off. I think all the horses are individual and I think that's down to the team at home that they, especially the two-year-old colts, you know, try and give them an easy time. You regret it quite quickly. You know, if you turn them out in the paddock, they damage themselves. They have two quiet days. They are loony bins when they come out. So I think each of, actually, they do actually still have to be treated very individually. Although, you know, and remember they are only out a deck size for an hour and a half out of 24 hours. So I don't think they're overworked, but I think the time between races and, and hard graft, you know, put time to put their heads down, have rolls and things, it is very important. Um, Diana, think, question here. Oh, sorry, Yogi. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I think this is where the routine comes in and is so important. And that when you do change your routine, 
that it is done gradually. If a horse is out of training and it's used to be turned out Monday, Wednesday, Friday because the ride or can't ride because of work commitments and they are ridden on Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturday and Sundays. As long as they've got into that routine, they know what to expect and they will settle into that routine. As Luke was saying, when they are in training, they are professional sportsmen and they are treated individually and they are in a routine that might involve much, much more work. But as long as one finds a routine for the horse that suits what one is doing with them, then I think that the horse will settle into that very happily. Um, quite an interesting question here, actually, Yogi, just to follow up on that. Um, an anonymous uh, correspondent says, in order to keep my horse sound and in one piece, my vet and farrier have suggested limited turnout. It's making me feel really guilty. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, limited turnout to me comes in two ways. One is the amount of time that it is turned out. And one, it is how you limit the area. Because what the vet uh, is, is after is that the horse is not running around, particularly this time of the year when we have had a lot of rain. It might be very, very muddy, muddy by the gate. The horse is running across the field, sliding as they come up to the gate, etc. And they might well do damage to them. Even horses that has no soundness problem could easily uh, do damage to themselves if they are not settled in uh, uh, being out. So to me, you can limit it by having a much, much smaller pen where the horse actually can't get to speed up and running around. There are some lovely round pens you can put and then move so you get to, to fresh ground and the horse can still have quality time out without actually doing themselves damage. Uh, Diana, a, a question here. How many horses are rehomed yearly through the Godolphin scheme on average in the UK? Um, it's well, it's very varied, obviously over the years. We've got, we've rehomed about two hundred and eighty since um, in the last few years. It's about about fourteen, fifteen. Um, basically, what we do when they've come in from um, either Charlie or Said, they've gone through the process that Yogi's described. They've been assessed. They've been let down. They've come back. They've been retrained. They've been they, they start the retraining process. And when they're ready, when Scylla Leonard, who's our rehoming manager, assesses them as ready. She'll invite applicants through our website. We've got a Godolphin Lifetime Care website. People can, can log on, have a look at them, see what like they like best. Then you start the kind of matchmaking. Um, they'll, the applicant will come and come and see the horse, come and perhaps ride whenever Scylla thinks that, that the horse is ready for it. And then we will we'll go ahead and um, hopefully agree a, a sale as such so that the horse can, again, the new owner can take, can take responsibility for the horse, but we'll always want to have first refusal when, you know, if ever something happens and that partnership needs to um, come to an end and we get the horse back to give them some sanctuary to back with us till, till the kind of end of the day, end of days. We've got some lovely paddocks with, with some great old friends out there at the moment. Um, Rachel's got a question here to everybody or anybody. Is there anything in particular that stands out when choosing a horse's new discipline? I have a three-year-old, he's only raced twice, but too slow in inverted commas. He's a chunky type and very bold. I'm looking to event him in the future. Is there anything you think I should be looking out for that could be an early indicator of whether this would be a good career pathway for him? Asks Rachel. Um, Yogi, do you want to take that one? Yes. I mean, like we said earlier, uh, the horse's natural pace is, of course, um, important. I think it's also when we talk about retraining racehorses into a different career, it's a little bit of where you're setting the goal because someone might get the horse out of training and the only thing they want to do is prelim dressage or 70, 80 centimeter show jumping or British eventing 90 or uh, uh, one meter. And then that would be the bar and you would be looking for a horse that, you know, had the capacity to do that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be a superstar within being eventing. Naturally, if you're looking at going around badminton and taking horses to teams, which race horses have done in the past, you are looking for maybe slightly different credentials. But if one is looking for something for the lower limits, uh, then I think very important with the temperament of the horse and the horse's natural balance. And again, like Luke was saying, his willingness of taking on what you're doing with him. But the majority of horses that come out of training, in my view, could be trained to do a prelim dressage test or jump 70, 80 centimeters around the show jumping track. 
We've got one question here. How do you get into the parades or shows for X racers? We'd love to attend one with my horse, but he wasn't the best race horse. Now, I think in order, correct me if I'm wrong, anybody, I think in order to get into one of the big marquee parades, I think the horse has to have had some, uh, well, notoriety is probably the wrong word, but some uh, level of, of fame. Um, but the race, uh, retraining of racehorses showing series are for everybody, whether you're amateur or professional. Um, there are qualifiers all over the country, all through the year. You've just got to have competition membership. You can get that on ror.org.uk. And the rider has got to be 15 years old or upwards on the 1st of January 2020. So the shows are available to anyone. If you just go on the website, you will get all the details, ror.org.uk. John, um, John, Nick, you're just saying about going to these shows. It's, it's quite interesting because you get to meet such a variety. Obviously, it's, it's fun to compete anyway. But you, you, you get to meet a variety of different people who've had a variety of different horses. And you get to discuss the de various problems that you've had with your horse and, and, and they tell you theirs. And you learn so much at those, you know, at Aintree when you have the big show up there, the big four day extravaganza. It's, it's, it's fantastic to listen to people just talking about their own experiences. And basically, that's how we learn in whatever you do in life, isn't it? It's, it is true. Now, just picking up on, on, on your experience with you know, ex horses who might have had a problem or two. Helen Edworthy says, My question is, are there any long term effects of using a racing saddle? My daughter rides in hers most of the time, um, a preference, and she's got three ex race horses. Would you still use a, a racing saddle on an ex race horse? Um, race, racing tack has changed tremendously over the years. Uh, a, a half tree saddle. Uh, particularly, you know, for, 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 for heavier work riders can sometimes, uh, you know, give the horse back issues. And that's exactly what I said about giving a horse when the first thing you should do when you get an x race horse is give that horse a, a full MOT. Um, and, and as Yogi said, it sometimes takes them a little bit of time to get used to, 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 to working in a GP saddle. Um, I take tremendous, uh, that's one of the things. You know, I have a, a stride free saddle. Um, there, are, there are all sorts of different saddles out there on the market, but it's just a matter of finding the, the, the bit and the tack and the saddle that suits your particular horse, that gives that horse confidence that you can then go forward. And if he's going forward and enjoying it, you can achieve an awful lot. And Diana, interesting observation here from Juliet Huckstep. She says, one area I struggled with is getting the full medical veterinary record of my retrained racehorse. By having this, it would have helped to ensure we understood some of his physical issues rather than both myself vet and physio having to kind of guess a bit. Um, we would be, be really good when offered up for retraining along with the passport, getting a full vet history. And a bit like you said earlier, you know, a bit like your car service history. You've got it all right. I think it, I mean transparency is such a positive way forward and a bit like having a car logbook you know why not have complete history an assessment tool for all the for all horses when they when they're leaving their their training environment would be would probably help someone like that enormously and as I say we're just really lucky that we have that communication again what you were the question you said asked earlier to Yogi I think communication both broadly but also amongst between the the seller and the and the new the new owner of the horse would be great. Makes all the difference in the world. The quicker the assessment, the, the more thorough it is, the quicker the horse, which is obviously what we're trying to help, um, has a much better and happier lifetime. And I, I, it is bang on the stroke of eight o'clock. But there are just two more questions I want to I want to get in because I, you've, you've been waiting really patiently. David Miller says, is it still possible to retrain an older national hunt horse whose career has come to an end? I'm guessing yes is the answer to that, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, everyone yes. agrees on that. Um, it is still possible. And the other question I wanted to ask was, it's a technical question. Helen Simpson says, I have a five-year-old um, off-track thoroughbred by Sepoy who's been off the track for 18 months, running three points points, came last in all of them. He's very willing, keen to please, and a joy to own. We're st still struggling to jump into a left canter. I've had him checked out, but the physio and vet say there's nothing wrong with him. There's no endemic physiological problem, just a little bit of stiffness. We originally felt that he probably uh, had only gone right-handed, but any experience in the group of horses with a mental block on jumping off onto a particular lead? I will, anybody? It's, it's not an unusual problem at all. Uh, m most race horses will naturally change leg through a race and when they go up the gallops, but depending on the construction of the gallop, which is uh, used, if horses are generally coming off a right turn onto their gallop, they usually pop into right canter first. And if they've done that for two, three years, 
in their life, they have got so used to going in one way or the other, that when you come to then reschool them and you start asking them to go off the other counter lead, then they can just have this block that a person asking the question. Sometimes it actually helps to do it in a turn, round a corner, or just as you're changing the rein. So you do it off a tighter turn, because then it becomes easier for the horse to go into that correct counter lead. Sometimes it might even help if you introduce them to going over a pole on the ground to actually go over a pole on the ground and strike off as you go over the pole in connection with turning in the direction where the horse finds it difficult to do it. You could also try to see if they find it easier to do it without a rider on the lunge or even if you are having a lunge ring and you can actually do it loose in connection with that. And then as with all the things, when you are working with the horse and you're teaching them, when they do it right, reward them. And the two best rewards a horse can have is to rest and to get something to eat. So if they do it right the first time, walk him, maybe giving a polo or a piece of apple or something like that, try again. Once they start doing it more and more right, then they learn through repetition. And then it's a matter of being able to do it again and again and again and again so that you start uh, laying the foundation for that they're going to understand it one way, uh, equally both ways. But there are some horses, even horses that have not been in racing, who will find it much easier to strike off the counter one way than the other. And it's a little bit like us being very left-handed or very right-handed. It's like uh, me trying to kick the ball with my left foot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take all that advice and apply it now to my um, three children, who I think I can hear a knot in bed, and the dog, um, who may have chewed everything in the kitchen. Um, thank you all very much for, for joining us. Uh, just to remind you that the next session is on Tuesday, so next Tuesday, the 8th of December at 7 o'clock, and amongst your panellists are Jenny Hall, the ROR Head of Welfare, Jason Webb of Natural Horsemanship, uh, Amanda Mills, retrainer, and Philippa James, the equine physiotherapist. So that is next Tuesday, the 8th of December, from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock via Zoom, just the same as uh, tonight. And it just remains for me to thank our fabulous panel, uh, Annalisa Balding, Yogi Breisner, Luke Harvey, and Diana Cooper. We will see you again, I hope, next week.